Hello there. In this video, you're going to join me in a little bit of a nostalgia trip to talk about the very first e-reader that I ever purchased and used. Um, I don't know, I'm, hopefully this will mean uh, as much to you as it does for me, but for 15 years I've been using e-readers and e-note-takers, and this device is where it all began. Uh, and it still feels very much like a special device to me. Uh, dated, for sure, but uh, nevertheless you can see the characteristics that makes it so special. So we'll be showing that later in the video. But before we go there, I can't tell this story without starting with the story of Fry's. So for those that don't know, Fry's was a major electronics retailer, mostly focused in California. They did have stores outside of California. They had a couple in Arizona, for example. Um, they were also in other states, mostly in the, near the West Coast, although there were a few in Texas and Georgia. Uh, I believe. I only visited a few of the stores here in California myself. Um, and it was a magical place. Uh, there's nothing like it anymore. Fry's doesn't exist. Um, it did go out of business with COVID, although COVID was really the last nail in the coffin, if you will, related to, to Fry's. It was kind of not doing well, well before COVID. Um, and in fact, there are a number of videos on YouTube that talk about that, um, and and you can see you know the the shelves are becoming more bare in these videos. It's somewhat it's somewhat depressing, but but interesting at the same time. So, for those that don't know what a fries is like, imagine a, a large kind of warehouse esque um, layout. Uh, you've got aisles that go on forever. You have lighting that's good enough, um, but maybe not as good as, as stores today. I like to kind of compare to understand what Fry's is like, to compare it to Best Buy. Best Buy really is kind of the, the last major electronics retailer that, that seems to be uh, hanging around, at least near where I live. And there's a, a lot of, and Best Buy is nothing like Fry's. <laughs> Fry's was way better than Best Buy in, in every respect. Well, except for one critical one, which is Best Buy's around and, and Fry's isn't. But let me just give a couple points of comparison. So if I go into a Fry's, um, I, there's going to be a lot of people that work there, and they will pay you no attention whatsoever. You, you can flow through. You're, no one's even going to say hi for the most part um, until you need their help. And if you go up to someone in a Fry's and say, listen, I, I need some assistance, um, very helpful at that point. So they ignore you until you need them, and then they're there for you, which was fantastic. You go to a Best Buy, it is the polar opposite. Walk through a Best Buy for 20 minutes. Uh, I ch the odds are, especially if it's during a slower time, that you're going to get accosted at least once, if not by a Best Buy employee, then by someone else from a different company that's coming there selling something, whether it's solar panels or so Samsung Electronics or what have you. Um, so Best Buy is the polar opposite, and I really miss how Fry's handled customer service because I thought they did a better job. Uh, I'd prefer to be left alone, but that's just me. So that's one aspect. Go to a Best Buy and look at the shelves where you have routing equipment. You know, I, I haven't been to a Best Buy in a while, but I have in the past, and I can imagine in my mind maybe, maybe a four or five foot long counter space, maybe three levels of that, and that might be where you, all your networking equipment is. When you go to Fry's, it is uh, shelves that stand way higher than I stand, and I'm six feet tall. And they go for 20 feet across. I mean, it, it, the amount of selection in a Fry's is incredible. Um, how geeky Fry's got is there were areas where you could buy Ethernet cables. And not only could you choose you know, what color of cable that you wanted, but they were spooled. So you can actually pull as much cable as you want and cut it to your specification. I, I don't know any other place like that. I'm sure there are out there somewhere, but the only time I've seen it is in a Fry's. So it's just an amazing place. And Fry's was the kind of place where 
you know, some there are days where you just wanted to go out, walk through the fries, and just look around. Uh, they had massive CD collections, DVD collections, video game collections, appliances, car electronics, computer electronics, um, backpacks. Uh, I mean, I, I could just keep going on and on. Rise was just incredible in terms of its, its selection, and it was just a fun place to walk around. And I used to walk around quite a bit just to look around and maybe come across something special. Okay, so one day, this is back in 2007, I'm walking around Fry's just to look around. And I'm toward the back. And the back section of Fry's is where all the computers were, uh, laptops, etc. And just in front of those, I came across this stand. And I don't remember if this was an end cap stand or if it was kind of a stand alone in the middle of the walkway. But the stand was for the Sony e reader PRS 505. The PRS stands for Portable Reader System. The 505 was not Sony's first e-reader, um, but it was certainly the first one I was ever aware of. Until I turned that corner and saw that kiosk, I had never heard of e-ink before. So on this stand is basically the sales pitch for e-ink. And at the time, there was a special deal. When you purchased uh, this device, you would get 100 free books. Now, I was familiar, of course, course with Project Gutenberg, and I knew that I could go online and probably get the same free books, but I have no interest on reading books on a computer screen, even back then, even before I knew of e-ink. It just was never something I wanted to do, you know, reading for pleasure on a computer. Um, but here was this device with this new technology and this ability to put over a hundred books uh, on this device and to read. Uh, really piqued my interest. I don't remember how much the device retailed for, but I, I could afford it at the time, and I ended up purchasing that device. Um, and the rest is history, as it were. Um, E-Ink delivered on all the promises the kiosk suggested for it. I ended up downloading a hundred books, you know, classics, um, from, you know, the Iliad uh, to the Federalist Papers, um, and, and more. I mean, I just, you know, I downloaded all 100 pretty much right away from the Sony store uh, and started reading. I didn't read all 100, I have to admit. I probably only read a fraction of them in the end. But nevertheless, the experience was an amazing experience, as anyone who reads with e-ink knows. The technology is, in my opinion, not, not just as good as reading from a book, but actually superior to it. Uh, and I know that's not everyone agrees with that assessment, but that's certainly how I feel. And so for me, my love affair with, with e-ink, and eventually with e-ink note-taking, it all started in this fries with this particular device back in 2007. So what I'm going to do in the next part of this video is I'm just going to show off the device a little bit. It's not a complicated device. It doesn't have all the levels of functionality that we're used to with e-readers. or certainly didn't have e-note-taking back then, but hopefully give you a sense of what this device was, and, and if I can, and I don't know if I'll be able to, but try to convey to some degree how special this device was. Um, I have never turned back since buying this device. I, the minute I've read my first book on the PRS 505, I've always favored e-ink um, to read, and that continues to this day. So it's a very special place for me. And uh, hopefully, maybe for you, uh, this will be familiar as well if you've had the PRS 505 uh, in your past. And if not, I guess it's a bit of a history lesson. Anyway, let's go take a look at the device, and uh, I hope you enjoy it. Okay, so let's start off by looking at the case um, that this device came in. Now, it's not really customary for me to save cases, and in fact, I didn't save the case. Um, this actually is a device I actually purchased from eBay. Um, I gave away my original device, something I regret. Um, but nevertheless, I, I never saved the case anyway, so in order to get a case, I would have had to have bought another regardless. Um, so the version I had was blue, which actually had a bit of a purple hue to it. I wish I had it, because it, it was really an impressive color. This one is silver, as we'll see. Um, and those were the only two colors that this was uh, sold in. Here's the front of the box. 
turn it around and we'll look at the, the side there. Classic Sony where, oops, make sure I get that in the focus, where just a ton of geeky technical information. Um, there's nothing wrong with that, of course, but one wonders if that approach would have been different um, if Sony had been a little bit if they had been as good on the technical aspects as they, or the marketing rather, as they would have been on the technical aspects, um, because Sony was first in the e-reader space um, before Amazon and the Kindle. But when we think of e-readers, there's the top, we don't think of Sony uh, for the most part, unless you happen to be someone like myself that that was there and had purchased a Sony device early. We think of of the Kindle. Just another great example of how Sony does such an amazing job and, and is such a pioneer in certain tech spaces and yet only to find that someone else comes swoops in and basically takes the market over. You know, the Sony store actually where you you purchase books from on this device actually closed almost a decade ago. Not quite not quite that long. But um and uh, it was it was there. It was there before uh, the Amazon store was. That is the Amazon store for the Kindle, not not Amazon as a bookseller. Um, but they just couldn't make it work uh, when their competitors did. So just a sad story. So the Sony store was actually one of my favorite stores, and and it's you know objectively wasn't any more special than bookstores of today. I just have a particular nostalgia for it. Anyway, let's move on to the device itself. And this one, the silver one, came with this really nice brown cover. And there you can see, oh, hopefully we can get into focus, the bottom of the device. Um, you, I don't know if the camera's going to pick this up very well. Oh, there we go. Uh, you can see there's a plastic tab right there on the left. That's important. I'll talk about that in a second. We'll look about... Look at the side, just a smooth edge there. And there is the top where your SD cards go in and they have two slots for that. One note about the cover, um, this cover is really one of the things that made the Sony device so special. Um, we're starting to get to that point among e-readers and other gadgets where covers are becoming more, f retaining their functionality but are less in the way. So old school covers, you know, over the last 10 to 15 years, were all about covering up the device, um, which is unfortunate, right? Because there's so much thought and design that goes into these devices. Um, so the ideal is to have covers that, that perform that protective functionality, but allow you to ad admire the device. And this cover, as we'll see in a second, does we are in a state now where, thanks to magnets, magnetic covers, etc., that, that we're starting to see um, covers kind of do that, where they allow the device to shine and, and still, still have that functionality. But that's relatively new. This Sony was doing this 15 years ago with this particular device. Um, so it was extraordinary then, and it really holds up now. If you open up the cover, one of the things that you would notice if you're holding the device is that there are magnets in the cover and you can't see them and you're not even sure they're there. But when you bring the cover to a close, you get this nice snap. Just a really neat visceral feeling um, that just added to the special nature of the device. Uh, it's And it's magnets on both sides. So you can see the device actually kind of acts almost like a page in a book. So really nice aesthetics from Sony on this, and just it just added to that special feeling to have those magnets and, and the feel of the leather. It's very it's nice and soft, um, really neat. Now one of the things uh, you can't do is you can't take this front page and fold it back. It's just too tight for that. It, you just get too much resistance. So how I used to read is I would either hold it with my left hand, and it was perfectly comfortable to do this, and then I could use my thumb to advance pages on this disc here, or I would hold it with my right hand, and then you can use these buttons 
on the side to advance pages. I think you'll notice right off the bat that this is a button heavy device. This particular device uh, was just before touch screens started to become available. So the buttons were absolutely necessary for navigation. Let's go ahead and boot this thing up. I'm gonna go to the top and I'm gonna just pull the slider over. There we go. Pops right on up um, really fast. Here we have uh, a menu. I don't know if this is the core menu. Let me go back. There we go. That's actually the uh, first page of the menu. There we go. Where you know you can have access to your library. You have different sort options. Um, it did allow for uh, audio files. It also allowed you the ability to read PDFs, um, and you could move files back and forth using one of the memory cards on top with your computer. But let's go ahead and look at the sample. So it came with 10 samples, and here are some examples. Uh, well, actually, these are all the samples because it numbers 1 through 10. And we'll open up Game of Thrones. And we'll just start reading. How do I do that? I think I click 1. Boom, you're in it. I'll just do some examples of page flips. Ah, oh, it looks great. You can tell that it's a little sluggish in terms of going from page to page. Um, there's a little bit of a flash as it refreshes each time. But, um, and the screen of course is smaller. This is a six inch screen. The other thing you'll notice, um, there is no front lighting. So that, uh, this device predated front lighting, uh, a tech that would come just a year or two later actually. What I used to have to do is I would actually buy uh, a little light that I would clip to the upper corner and it would have a snake arm and there's a, a LED light and I would use that to read in the dark. Um, pretty archaic <laughs> compared to what we're able to do today, but back then that's that's essentially what I had to do. Again, if I use this button down here, I can still advance pages. I'm pretty sure I could change the font size. Here's a magnifying glass. Let's take a look. Yeah, there we go. Maybe go in a little bit further. Um, so yeah. Nice ability. I don't remember if these... I'm not sure what this button does. And this is the bookmark button, if I remember correctly. See, there's a little bookmark up there. You have to remember that this is the device... Um, that there were no uh, e-readers for me before this. There were e-readers that predated this particular device. This was not the first one on the market, but this was certainly the first one I was aware of. Um, and just this ability to to read books. Um, I think the box, somewhere in the box, it says you can put out about 120 books onto the device, which is just, at the time, extraordinary to think that all that would fit in a form factor like this. Um, if I press this again, it'll go back. So you'll notice that down below it says small for text. You click it again, medium, and then finally with large. So it had the three modes. Again, this turns the pages, bookmarks it. This takes you to the menu. This, So, it, you know, the it's a lot of buttons, but it's actually not that complicated to learn. Um, and yeah, what an amazing device this was. It obviously does not sleep when you close the cover. You have to flip the power button on top to do that, like so. And there's a view of the back of the device. Um, you know, if you compare this device to modern e-readers, you know, there's nothing superior about this. Although I would argue that there's still something special about the case and, and its presentation and how much it tries to emulate and bridge that gap between a book and an e-reader, um, which is something that Sony even gave up on after this device. I don't believe they used this type of, of cover. 
uh, subsequent to the 505. But nevertheless, um, if you look at it strictly from the perspective of uh, the e-reading experience, you know, we have higher resolution text. Um, this was, I can't remember what the DPI was on this. I want to say it's, it should be somewhere on the box. Um, I think it's in the hundreds though. Let's see. It doesn't say. But I'm pretty sure that's it's it's in the hundreds. Regardless of what the actual DPI is, um, certainly modern e-readers are, are a little bit lighter, uh, have higher DPIs, faster refresh rates. There's no reason that you would use a device like this today. The technology has moved along. Front lighting, um, you know, obviously uh, touch screens, etc. So, so this technology has left this behind. I mean, my nostalgia doesn't run that deep that I would continue to use this. But I would say for a long time, um, and even, even now, again, in terms of design, I mean, there's just something special about this device. And uh, there's no, as far as I know, E.E. E. and Call of Fame. But if there was, this might be my first nominee um, for that. So... Anyway, I don't know how much this came across in the video uh, or how much you enjoyed it, but hopefully you uh, enjoyed this trip down memory lane. And that, in a nutshell, is the Sony PRS 505 in action. It's my first e-reader that I ever bought. It's what started me. Uh, this is really where all the troubles began for me. It started me on this crazy e-ink journey, um, and there'll always be a special place in my heart for this device. Thanks for indulging me and I hope you have a great day.